This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. For I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. This is the third Sunday of Advent, and we shall now light the Advent candles. On this third Sunday in Advent, we relight the candles of prophecy and love and light the third candle that represents the joy that we feel and express at the coming, at the coming of the Christ child to Bethlehem, to the world and into our lives. Now may the peace of God continue to be with us as we worship him today because we want him to come. He came once and we want him to come again. Now we shall be blessed and sung by Brother Frederick Merriman and Brother Tyler Batchett. Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? 
He confessed. He did not deny, but confessed. I am not the Christ. So they asked him, And who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Tell us so that we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John said, I am the voice of one shouting in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked John, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not recognize, who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the strap of a sandal. These things happened in Bethany, across the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. This is God's holy writ for God's people for this day. May your hearts and minds meditate upon it. May your souls prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, God of all ages, God of times past, the God of the present, and the God of the future. To an own time God, a right now God, a God of the here and now, to this triune God we pray, God of the flesh, God of the spirit, and God the creator. Father, we kneel before thee in this season of our Christian worship because you so loved us in the midst of our sins that you sent God, your only begotten son, incarnated and wrapped in human flesh so that he may feel as we feel, hunger as we hunger, suffer as we suffer, to take upon the sins of all humanity so that we may be free, so that we can have communion and reunion so that we shall not be estranged, but reunited. We may have the joy of an everlasting covenant with you, and that we have an eternal home with you, O oh Lord. And God, I pray that others may hear your voice and see your love and feel your divine presence wherever they may be know what true love is. May they share themselves of hypocrisy. May they share themselves of materialism. And may they reach out for a true tender touch of love. In Jesus' everlasting name we pray. And the people of God say Amen. That was my granddaughter Nakaya Dowdy that lit the advent candles for us. This is the first time back here since um, the pandemic and she wanted to come today to be with us. There's only um, five of us here, including her, and I am grateful for her today. Also, we shall have another selection um, from this musician and soloist. And so we thank God for them. <laughs>
and one who was proclaiming his coming. Um, so we're going to take a look at a few verses here that reach out to help establish our subject for today. Again with verse 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed. He did not deny but confess, I am not the Christ. So they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. This reading is also part of the lectionary for the church calendar year for this year. So I have a title, sort of a long title for me, but it's Know Who You Aren't. Then Know Who You Are. Know Who You Are Not. Then Know Who You Are. Another way is, then you shall know who you are. Let us pray. God, we are struggling today. God, with establishing our firm foundation with our identity. Some of us believe that we are what others say about us. Some of us are swimming in a river of grand delusion. We're hearkening unto social media. We're hearkening unto the voice of the enemy. And God, the rivers and the canyons of self-aggrandizement have caused us to lose our way. Speak now through your word that we may truly discover who we are by learning who we are not. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Phil Hooper states that if you have ever stood at the rim of a canyon, you know what it is to comprehend the immense majesty of emptiness. These clefts in the earth, called by the incessant flow of water over millennia, are rocky vessels holding a world unto themselves. And all you have to do, my sisters and brothers, is look at the Grand Canyon. And you can understand what Hoopa is talking about. Now, peer over the edge and look down into the sky hill between the canyon walls. A highway for the howling wind and winged creatures of the air. Look down upon the stubborn shrubs clinging to the ledges where tiny crawling things seek their precarious shelter. And then look down down, down to the bottom, to the river, the sinuous originator of the landscape, still eroding and shaping the earth in its insistent passage towards a distant area, a distant sea. In the canyon, we can perceive how negative space has its own power. We find that we are just as compelled by the vastness of what is missing, what has been hollowed out, as we are by what remains. There is potentiality in this chasm, a certain thick luminous, a sense of seeing deep into the heart of things that are usually hidden underneath the surface. And my sisters and brothers, Perhaps it is 
in just such a wilderness that we might imagine John the baptizer. His voice crying out, echoing off the wizened rock face, mingling with dust and bird song, proclaiming a coming that will soon carve its own path through the petrification of the human heart. A coming that will strip us bare of falsehood and pretension. A coming that will carve out an authentic understanding of ourselves in the cosmic landscape. Like the emptiness of the canyon, though, our authenticity is predicated, first, upon an understanding and an, upon an honest assessment of that which is not there in order to reveal the deep truth that remains. Who are you? John is asked, I am not the Messiah. Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? No. Relinquishment of these identity markers is his first act of truth telling. John knows that he must name the roles to which he is not called before he can affirm that to which he is. And so must we. We must do the same. How often we wish that we were the Messiah, the long expected sovereign of our own small dominions. How often we take on the titles offered to us, not because they fit, but because they make us feel more real to ourselves. And how readily we assign these roles to others in order to suit our purposes. But just as the canyon only becomes itself in the void, so too with us. In each of our own negations, we get closer to the spare, essential truth of our identity. I am, John admits, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight way the coming of the Lord, a voice, an invisible resonance piercing the air. Nothing more and nothing less than this. <coughs> and this is exactly what God needs him to be. I hope this is getting through. He is exactly what God needs him to be. Nothing more and nothing less. And some of us want to be more than what God intended us to be. There's much to learn from him here. In the watery depths of the canyon, especially in this frenetic and anxious season. Faced with the multiplying needs of our families, our communities. And even our planet, as we are frequently tempted to take on far more than we can actually do or be. God never intended for you to be able to be a multitasker of 25 uh, activities at one time. Really, research has proven that nobody really multitasks. Multitask. The brain only functions, I mean, the brain only works on one activity at a time. You may have 25 things going on, call yourself multitasking, but you focus on one and then the brain shifts to another. You're only focusing on one event at a time. We can be tempted to be more and do more than what we actually should be enabled to do or be. And even as many of us attempt to slow down, be more attentive in this liturgical season. The world continues to surround us and shout, Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you, Brother Berryman? Who are you, Brother Ty? Who are you and what is your answer? Stripped of your big boy toys, your big, your big girl.
your old fashions, your titles, your prefixes and suffixes. Relinquish of your charm, that rickly suave charm and your good looks, that Beyonce and, and all those other women out there that you consider beautiful. Relinquish of your staggering IQ, maybe a member of Mensa. Stripped of your humorous wit, you're the life of the party. You can crack jokes just like Richard Pryor used to be able to do. Stripped of your dazzling car, you can have it shined up. I mean, it's, it's a beauty. Whenever you drive up, people just want to take a look at your car. Stripped of your magnificent home. It, your home ought to be in, in better homes and gardens. Stripped of your boisterous bank account. The Lord has been good to you and you have uh, been able to save and invest and money's not an issue for you. But stripped of all of that, who are you? Who are you when you have all of these things that are no longer part of your life? Several decades ago, and many of you uh, remember this show, my granddaughter probably does not, but several decades ago there was a TV show called All in the Family. And All in the Family poked fun of, a blue, of, of all blue collar bigots in America. Through the lead bigot, Archie Bunker. And if you remember Edith, she go, Archie! And on one show, Archie told his wife, Edith, that he wanted to be on the bowling team so bad that he could taste it. He described the bowling shirts that the cannonballers wore, all yellow silk with bright red piping on the collar and sleeves. You see, being on that bowling team, dressed with these cannonballs, that was, some, that, that was part of his identity that he really wanted to be. And on the back, there's a picture of a cannon fire. <coughs> Find a cannonball and a set of pins. And he said, when you got something like that on your back, Edith, you know you're somebody. To him, that was a part of his identity. That show was satirizing that a man could gain a sense of identity and importance for being a part of a bowling team and wearing a silk shirt. But that antidote raises a question. Who are you? And what is the source of your identity? Like John, ourselves for God to accomplish God's work, then we must respond with, I am not the Messiah. Some of you allow folk in your lives to make you feel like you are the Messiah. What do I mean by that? Not that you are God, but you are a God type. Every time something happens, they run to you. They need some money, they run to you. <clears throat> Car is broken, they run to you. Something wrong with their house, they run to you. And here you are, stretched out, stretched in. You have your own issues, you have your own house to keep up. You don't mind helping, and I know I'm talking to somebody, but you are now stretched thin yourself. And for some reason, you don't know how to you don't know how to say no. You are not the Messiah. There was a book that we read, and in that book there was something called the Anointed No. Our book club read that. It's called the Anointed No. God anoints no just as much as He anoints yes, because you cannot fulfill God's purpose in your life and do it the best that you can, and you are stretched so thin because you are saying yes to everything. Sometimes, no is just anointed as yes. <coughs> you must be willing to say, <coughs> I am not the king. I am just a sinner saved by grace just like you. And I serve God the best way that I know how. I get up in the morning. I say my prayers. I'm thankful to God. I brush my teeth, I take my bath, I put my clothes on. Ladies, you put on your pants or you put on your skirt. Men, you put on your pants and you get up and you face the world. We all face the world somehow, some way. You take your meds, you exercise, you do what you need to do. Drink your coffee, eat your breakfast, 
and you go out and face the world, you're no longer working. You are, some people who are retired are busier now than when they were working on a J-O-B. But we all have to face the world somehow. But understand that when you face the world, understand what you are not. And when you know what you are not, you can determine what you are. And when you know what you are, you can serve God the best that you can. And when you know what you are, you can be the best father, you can be the best husband, you can be the best grandmother, you can be the best wife, you can be the best child, you can be the best daughter, the best son, the best cousin. When you know who you are, you can be the best pastor, you can be the best steward, you can be the best trustee, you can be the best whatever it is that God has put on your plate. But understand, you have to know what it is. And we must be willing to disappoint the expected throne. We must be willing to embrace the emptiness of what we were never meant to be. Some of us are serving in positions we were never meant to be. You can't say what two plus two is without scratching your head. And yet here you are serving on some board or some commission in the community or in the church and it takes you the longest just to try to figure out simple, basic math. Mm -hmm. Honey, mm -hmm. son, boo-boo, <laughs> cherry, yeah. cherry pie, sugar plum. Maybe you are not meant to be on that board. Amen. Number crunching is not your gift. Your gift can be hospitality. Your gift can be being a mechanic. Your gift can be crunching uh, uh, potatoes or making pies. Your gift can be carpentry, but your gift may not be number crunching. I hope somebody's hearing me. Find out where your gifts are. Serve what, where you are and know who you are and what you are not. Get in and there playing with those numbers and, no, and when the numbers are all done, none of the numbers make sense and nobody knows what to do. I'm trying to figure out how, how you got this, how you got to this place. Understanding who you are. And then perhaps we will find that one voice that was ours to claim all along. For John, the purpose of his own voice is clear the announcement of God's incarnated power. And so he baptizes in the river the agent of transformative power, inviting others to let themselves be scoured by him, to let their layers of defensiveness and artifice be stripped away to hollow out a space in their hearts in preparation for the one who is coming after, the Christ, the one who is making all things new. And here, and in another time, and in another wilderness, John's invitation remains open to us, and it is as urgent as ever because we are still learning who we are and who we are not. Like the canyon, we are still being shaped we are still being laid bare to the wind and the light, still becoming as deep and open and vast as God imagines we can become. And like John, it is only in the cultivation of our own holy emptiness that we will at last be the vessel of God's and breaking purpose to bring good news to the oppressed. Hello, somebody. <clears throat> to bind up the broken heart, to let them know that there is a God who loves them to let them know that it can be all right to proclaim liberty to the captives. I know, my brother, that drugs has you bound. I know, my sister, that you had to make a living the only way that you thought you knew how, but I'm here to tell you that there is a God who can set you free, to let them know that there is a God who loves them, to let them know that if God can do it for me, and I used to be out there too, that I thought I was the cheapest of sinners. I thought I was the baddest of the bad, but when I was at my lowest, I heard a voice, and that voice was calling unto me, and I reached out, and I discovered that his name was Jesus. I know a God who can release the prisoners, and I read in scriptures that when Peter was locked up, that the angel came and shook the prison and released him. And then when Paul and Silas were locked up, the angels came and released them. 
And if God can do that for them, and if God did it for me, and if God did it for Brother Rico, and if God did it for Brother Berryman, and if God did it for Brother Tyler, and if God is doing it for my granddaughter, and if God did it for my brother Curtis Wilson, if God did it for Sister Murray Powell, if God did it for every member of Holland Chapel, and if he's not done it and you're not free, he's on his way to do it, then I know that God is able, that God is able, that God is able, and we ought to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of all God to comfort all who mourn. We ought to be able to say, pick your head up, baby, because you won't have anything to be ashamed of because Jesus went to the cross First he came into Bethlehem. He was born of a virgin. But now he went to the cross. And when he went to the cross, all your sins were hung on that cross. And now you are covered by his blood. And you ought to pick your head up. And you ought to understand what joy is. And when you know what joy is, it's something on the inside that begins to work on the outside. And Jeremiah said, it's like fire. It's like fire shut up in my bones. And if you know that you have that kind of joy, you ought to say, yeah! Yeah! Amen. The Lord is in this place. The Lord wants to move in your heart. Allow God to move in your heart, to move in your space. That space of nothingness and fuel it with something. Once God cleanses your heart, you've got to feel it with God. You've got to feel it with God. Scripture says that unless once you're cleansed of evil, if you don't feel it with goodness, so demons can come back seven times stronger. See, they come back with reinforcements. You kick the devil out of your heart. He's angry. He's mad. So he's coming back with his, with his boys. It's like the boys on the street. And you try to kick them out of the hood, you kick one or two out. And they say, this is our turf. And they're going to come back with reinforcements. They're going to come back with a whole game. But guess what? If you fill it with God's goodness and the Holy Spirit resides in your heart, it's just like when you kick one or two out in the hood and you got the whole neighborhood that's backing you and they cannot contend. But you have to want them to come. Fill your heart with Jesus. If you do this, you can be saved. All you have to do is just call on his name and say, Jesus, I've done so many things that are wrong and I'm so tired and I know I believe I think there's a devil way I've heard about you and maybe you haven't but just call on his name and if you believe in your heart that he was born of a virgin I may be hard for your company and I saw it he was raised from the dead and now he has all power in his hands and you shall be saved confess with your mouth speak it and he is my savior <coughs> and you are saved and salvation belongs to you May the peace of God that passes all understanding rest with and abide with us all, henceforth and forevermore.